Oops. All right, we'll give it a moment to give folks time to join us. Okay, good evening. Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Sarah Manguzo launching her new book, Very Cold People. She'll be talking with Elizabeth McCracken, so you are in for an excellent time tonight. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Sarah, to Elizabeth, and to the team at Hogarth for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Whether we're gathering in our stores or online, our community of authors and readers is amazing. We're so grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. A couple little housekeeping things. Um, in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first one is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. Let us know where you're logging in from. I know we have at least three time zones in the house tonight. Um, it's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees, make it feel like an actual party. If you do have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post the question in the Q&A. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And very importantly, tonight's featured book, Very Cold People, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue locations, where you can purchase Sarah's book and many others on site. And you can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the buy link in the chat in a moment. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we're offering 10% off the featured book. Enter the coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. You don't have to actually remember that. I will put it in the chat, I promise. And if you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Okay, introductions. Our interviewer tonight is Elizabeth McCracken, who is the author of three novels, three collections of short stories, and a memoir. Her eighth book, The Hero of This Book, will be published this October, and we appreciate Elizabeth so much for her support of fellow authors and of bookstores. We're happy that she's here with us tonight. She's going to be speaking with our featured author, Sarah Manguso. She's the author of eight books, including The Guardians, which she presented at Greenlight in 2013, and most recently, 300 Arguments, which was named a Best Book of the Year by more than 20 publications. She's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Hotter Fellowship, and the Rome Prize, and her work is regularly featured across the New York Times Magazine, O oh, the Oprah Magazine, and The New Yorker, among others. She grew up in Massachusetts and now lives in Los Angeles, where she's joining us from tonight. Her brand new book, Very Cold People, is her first novel. So she's written with charismatic precision, a masterwork on growing up in and out of the suffocating constraints of a very old and very cold small town. It's an ungilded portrait of girlhood at the crossroads of history and social class, and it's a vital confrontation with an all-American whiteness where the ice of emotional restraint meets the embers of smoldering rage. It's a haunted jewel of a novel from one of our most virtuosic literary writers, so we are so lucky to be here with her tonight. Sarah is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with Elizabeth and then taking your questions as well. So Sarah, please take it away. Thank you so much for that, Jessica. It's great to be back. Um, I'm reading my very cold book from a very warm place. Uh, it was 90 degrees a couple of weekends ago. All right, I've mentioned the weather already. That's not a great sign, just kidding. Um, I'm going to read to you from the beginning of the book uh, for about seven minutes, and then um, Elizabeth will start running the show. If you see a cat, her name is Pebble. Chapter one. My parents didn't belong in Waitsfield, but they moved there anyway. My mother answered the first knock at the door of the new house, expecting a casserole. We'd painted the house evening fog, she told me, but the woman from across the street wanted to know why we'd painted it purple like Italians. Some people wore their difference honestly, but my parents were liars, illegitimate Waitsfielders, their off-whiteness discovered only after the paint had dried. By the time I was born, the house had faded to the color of dirty snow. The oldest houses in Waitsfield were older than the town and bore plaques to mark their age. 
Generations of families had been born and died in them, and the town's six graveyards were populated mostly by children. Over the centuries, the slate stones had eroded and sunk in the dirt, and they looked like gray, crooked teeth inscribed with little lambs and angels. On the way to school, I walked past a 300-year-old mustard yellow salt box that my mother admired for its leaded glass windows and historically correct paint color. It probably had all the right antique fixtures inside, big sooty hearths and Indian shutters, visible proof of connection to the first best people. My mother referred to Western Massachusetts as out west, and I was mostly ignorant of the geography beyond our neighborhood. Three quarters of the town stayed unknown to me, and that mystery drummed up a sense of scale. To this day, I couldn't tell you how to get to the lodge school where the rich kids went. It was just there somewhere in those 10 square miles, not for me to find. I often asked my mother to drive us down to the part of town where every house had a plaque. It looked like a movie set. I knew a girl whose house had been used in a TV ad for a clothing store. The ad was shot in the spring and the crew had sprayed the lawn and the windowsills with sticky fake snow. At home, my mother cut out wedding announcements from the courier, the only paper in town. Maybe the groom was a Cabot and the bride was an Emerson and they sat on the boards of libraries and museums. My mother didn't know these people, but she liked the way they looked on our refrigerator. She also liked to study an old typeset record of the town's census, turning the well-handled pages as one would a beloved picture book. But there were no pictures, just lists of names and addresses. She cross-referenced the addresses with real estate listings in the courier each week. Sometimes she took me to look at the big old houses, I never saw any people, just the houses, big Georgian colonials with widow's walks and little gabled windows like third eyes opening. I liked the estates too, especially on Pond Road, which my mother told me was the most expensive street in town. Pond was a dead end, so it took some, per it took some persuading to get my mother to drive the length of it and turn the car around. But when I reminded her that we'd never seen another soul walking or even driving around there, she could be tempted. Those houses weren't old. They were just enormous and ornate with statuary and foreign made cars. A couple of them were always under construction and hidden under blue tarps. I recognized the difference between the houses that were the oldest and those that were merely the most expensive. I liked the old houses and I swooned over the girls and boys at school with names like Verity and Cornelius. I knew that I could never build the kind of relationship with money that the people in those stately drafty oldest houses enjoyed. I didn't even bother trying to infiltrate them. I worshiped them from a distance. In our house, the old paint on the windowsill had its own sweet smell, different from the wall paint. I felt all around the window sash to find a draft, but there was none. The cold was just everywhere. After the monthly mortgage payments, my parents had almost nothing left over and we had to be careful. For one thing, the bathtub had to be filled to the height of my hand and no higher. I pressed my fingertips into the bottom of the tub, not knowing where my hand ended and my wrist began. One summer, I found a green garden hose on the ground next to a neighbor's house. The hose had been left on. I tried to calculate the amount of water that had been wasted. What are we gonna do? I asked the other kids. They didn't answer. Adrenaline spilled into my blood. Water poured into the muddy ground. An old Irish cable knit cardigan with leather buttons hung in the downstairs coat closet, which smelled of hot farts and smoke. If anyone ever needed a sweater, they could go and put on the warming sweater, which was its name, as if other sweaters were merely decorative. My mother kept the house just cold enough for me to need to wear the warming sweater over my regular sweater, and she cut just enough plastic wrap to cover the diameter of a dish. I sat on the carpeted floor with my back against the radiator. It slowly bruised me and if the heat turned on, it turned my skin red in columns. A sheet of rigid plastic leaned between the radiator and the wall. It was meant to reflect heat back into the room. We had two sugar maples in the backyard and my mother liked them best because their leaves turned bright red, the farthest possible from their original green. One of the maples got sick and she hired a man to cut it down. She said that the man had come and started cutting and that she'd stopped watching him and that when he came back to the house to get paid, she looked again and saw that he'd cut down both maples, dead and gone. She would mourn those red trees for the rest of her life. 
When I walked home from school, I picked up leaves that were gold specked crimson, green edged vermilion, purple black. I picked everything up, pebbles and matchbooks and little things people dropped. In December, I picked up evergreen branches and taped them to my bedroom door and made decorations, a little Christmas garland just for me. One day, my mother emptied my jacket pockets and found two half-used matchbooks and screamed at me. I could have started a fire, but I wouldn't have wasted a match to start a mere fire. I'd found what someone else had thought was trash, so I took it. One inch of rain equals 10 inches of snow, we all knew, but that had to be approximate since there were so many different combinations of snow and ground. I remember the metallic smell of it in the air before it fell, the pale blue of it on a clear morning, the soft f of it falling, the powder of the coldest days, too cold to melt, squeaking at the boot, white wet snow squeaking against my teeth, melting clear in the heat of my mouth. Snowfalls have unique bouquets. Snow isn't just frozen water. It carries a remnant of the sky. A blue hailstone tastes different from a white one because they've taken on air at different altitudes. We ate icicles not because they tasted good, but because they were a primal thing that could not be bought. To eat one was to dare someone to tell you it wasn't clean, that there was dirt in it, which we all knew. Everyone eats a peck of dirt in their life. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, Sarah. Oh, it's so good. Um, I'm so delighted that you read about the warming sweater and also about the icicles. Um, but I love all of this book. I think you know that you're one of my favorite living writers. Oh, which somehow it's a more goodness. serious quantity than just saying one of my favorite writers. Um, and Thank you. I can take the compliment, but I cannot digest it. Just so you know, it's yeah, just, just gonna. I need to sit with it. That's that's, that's, that's what a about big New Englanders. One. You put it in your pocket. Well, I mean, that's that's my special excitement about talking with you because we grew up within five miles of each other, and many of the details, I'm sure, <laughs> were familiar to you. And um, they, yeah, I, I, I'm, e I'm eager. I'm eager to hear what what seemed what seemed the most real. It's 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 one of my my first questions. Yeah, I think you 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 put the compliment in your pocket like one of those strenuous New England candies that can't possibly be <laughs> strenuous. Chewed. Just yes. warm it up. <laughs> bit like oh, a bit of honey. That's ex exactly or like a bit of honey. Mary Jane. Yes, yeah. I love both of those, oh, and they cause wonderful. They cause so much physical pain at the same time. Yeah, they will rip your crown right out. <laughs> Um, I, in the fall of 2020, I reread Ongoingness, The Guardians, and The Two Kinds of Decay. Didn't read your books of poetry or 300 Arguments because they were in my office where I wasn't going. <laughs> um, and it was, the, the fall was when it, we, we were sort of like, yeah, this is going to last for a while. Yeah. I'd quite be hopeful. Thing, things started to get weird. Things, and, and I just, I, I read those three books because I was trying to write something and it and they were very the I had read them all rereading them was really meaningful and I wrote to you and said I just read these books and you wrote back and said I wrote a novel um and you sent it to me and I remember <laughs> nothing thinking, else just I wrote a novel <laughs> you know it wasn't we had a conversation it wasn't like okay. oh I, I'm just feeling like, like I'm going for the people who might be listening that's yeah that's okay. that's fair <laughs> we, had a, we had a lovely and personal um, exchange of emails. At the end of that exchange, you said, <laughs> I wrote a novel. Um, and I remember being very excited and also slightly worried as one is when somebody says, oh, I'm, I'm going into, I'm branching into a different genre. Um, and oh. I, I read the book and I, I just loved it. And I, I loved it, even though it's not the novel I would have extrapolated having just read a big chunk <laughs> of your work um and in fact i think um one of the reasons that i i i would really like to talk about those new england details because so many of them were even though i'm a, a little older than you but turtlenecks from calverts with little hearts on them yes yes um yeah. prell shampoo oh i can still <laughs> smell it yeah 
See the little bead going up as you turn it over? Oh God, yes. <laughs> and, and one of the things that really st struck me about it is that even though all of those details, there were things that I'd forgotten about or things that I hadn't, but there's nothing nostalgic about the book. The, mm. the way that it's written feels like it presents these details um, and the, the way that children think as immediate and monumental in the way of childhood. And one of the things I'd forgotten about is how monumental some of those details are. The fact that Ruthie, your narrator, notices details about every public bathroom she goes into. I'm like, yes, that's childhood. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, this public bathroom has no door. This one has a big heavy door. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to know whether you did sort of any how, how, you, how you came to all those details? Did you do research? Did you just write down stuff that you remembered? I love this question. Um, it reminds me of a short passage, maybe even from an interview that William Maxwell gave um, in, it must have been his 70s or his 80s. And, um, oh, now I remember, he was in correspondence. It, it, he was writing letters back and forth with another writer and, um, that other writer was uh, concerned that all she knew how to do was to, you know, write in her diary. And, um, you know, she had this, there, there was a worry about um, remembering wrong or remembering the wrong details or forgetting the good part. And one of the things he said to her was, if you are a rememberer as I am, everything will always be with you. And I remember reading, I remember reading that um, and thinking, okay, this guy's in his eighties. It, it's not gonna go away. I, I, I also have been a rememberer. I don't remember narrative necessarily. If I watch a movie with you, I will forget the ending unless it's like incredibly memorable. You know, even if it's incredibly memorable, I might just forget the ending. But there are, um, the things I remember are just, um, they're particles and they, they sort of, I don't, I don't know. I mean, neurologically, certainly there might be something going on, but I remember just, you know, five, five pages or five details out of a book or um, five moments out of a friendship or um, one bathroom out of a school. And I remember it was such vivid clarity that um, I don't know, maybe it like crowds out the surrounding material because I, I'm terrible at, at remembering like a whole story. Like, don't ask me to tell you a funny story about something that happened to me. I'll tell you like one funny line of dialogue and then you're gonna have to, you know, propel the conversation in some other direction. Um, so no, no research was done. Um, and I do, I do find that it is true that there's, there's material that if you don't, if you don't, I should say, if I don't mine it, if I don't use it, um, if I don't put it into a book, it stays in me just as potent as it always was. Um, you mentioned my book, The Two Kinds of Decay, which is about uh, a period of acute illness that I suffered in my 20s. I didn't write about that for seven years after it ended. And when I did write about it, I didn't have to do any research. I, I just, I wrote down everything I remembered. After I was done, I, I looked back into whatever files I had. I had some medical records. I had some nurses notes. I had some random artifacts and I looked at everything and I, I, I didn't see anything else that I needed to put into the book. And that was the first time that I published a book and then realized a couple of years down the road that I had forgotten everything. I like, there was this sort of release that was allowed, that I allowed myself after putting it into the book. And so much of the 1970s and, um, you know, the early eighties when I was very young living in Massachusetts, um, all, you know, all of those details were just, you know, they were, they were just completely unmined. They were, they were like pure. And, um, it's, it's wonderful to excavate and, you know, almost expel this really old material. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, do you ever have a dream about something like really fundamental to your identity? Like some, like some um, you know, like Freudian or very um, like early trauma and then wake up and think like, oh man, I am getting just some really good material. <laughs> or am I the only, no, it, yeah, certainly, certainly you must do that. I, I felt that 
all the time as I was writing this book. It was, I, I read some review and it was a terrific, entirely positive review of very cold people, but it referred to you as a minimalist. And I feel like this book is quite maximal in a way, even though it's oh, about, wow. it's moment to moment in some ways, but it feels so packed with detail and feeling and do you, do you have a I'm so pleased you read it that way I don't I don't really mind the word minimalist as much as I mind the word fragment which mm -hmm. I, I really find fault with um which we can talk about down the road but uh, last night I was at a dinner and I was sitting across the table from the genius John Clausen um those of you with very young yes. children in the audience will recognize him as the genius who wrote, I want my hat back. This is not my hat. And we found a hat. <laughs> He's, um, you know, he, he does um, primarily picture books with not very much text. Um, and he illustrates books for other similar amazing geniuses. And we, you know, we talked about the problem of being called minimalist. And he told this wonderful origin story, um, which I hope you don't mind uh, my, my sharing. He, he said that one of his early jobs was as a storyboarder at a big commercial movie production company. And so, you know, it, they had huge budgets. And so there were always like buildings exploding and, you know, like just, you know, big, big, big events being depicted on the screen. And so it was his job as a storyboarder, of course, to, you know, make these, these shots. Uh, on paper. And um, he said that there was this one day when he had to draw yet another building exploding. And instead of doing so, he just, he made a picture of like a little bottle rolling down a road to signify that the building had exploded. And his boss said, you know, you, you actually do have to write, have to, you know, say that the, the building's exploding and show like the actual explosion. And um, at that point, uh, you know, somebody, maybe that very supervisor recognized that, you know, John Clausen's gifts were probably more going to be more relevant in another form. And then he talked about how, like, you know, his whole life had been about trying to get credit for, get credit for an assignment without actually doing the assignment. And I, and I thought, oh, my God, that's what I've been trying to do all my life. You know, in high school, assign me a five page paper, but I'll get it all done in two and a half pages. Um, and, you know, similarly, like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll write a narrative, you know, I'll write a narrative memoir, but, um, you know, none of the pages will have more than 75 words on them, you know, when that's my book on going this, you know, it's just, I used to, I used to use the word lazy to describe that, but listening to John Clausen last night, I just think like, okay, well, yeah, it's just like a different, you know, it's a different aesthetic relationship to memory and to expression and like just a different way of um, invoking narrative, using narrative. So um, to be called a maximalist is very thrilling. Um, you know, as I said, I don't mind being called a minimalist, but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm a person and this sort of like, edges into what um, I think we would call Yankee thrift. Um, there's there's right. a kind of pleasure in using as few materials as possible to get the job done. And I think that definitely has something to do with the way that I grew up, just culturally, um, financially, and, um, you know, it was considered virtuous to be frugal, to make do with what was there, to, um, you know, uh, not with just material things, but with language and with, with, you know, really every thought, movement, and gesture in New England is more virtuous if it's more frugal. I did, I, I loved hearing you read that section because it does, it feels in a strange way, almost like a, an aesthetic manifesto for the book in that way in which it's, I'm gonna take this, you weren't using this, not the matchbook, not the, you're, I'm oh. gonna take the icicles, <laughs> I'm gonna take, and it feel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, um, you know, a, a graffiti on a, on a school desk and it feels like it's this, ordering is the wrong word, but it feels, the book itself feels so um, visually complicated to me and also emotionally complicated. But in fact, it is, it's built of detritus in a way. Yeah. It's like, that's a theme of the whole book is 
the things that are left behind, the things that are free, the things not wasting things. But the book itself seems so sort of bejeweled with cast off things. I love that description of it. I haven't heard that before. Uh, yeah, it's um, so actually, I'd love to talk about um, fragments and also I would love to talk about, I'm very excited that I get to ask you this question. I'd like to talk about paragraphing. Oh no, and, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but just about sort of like that, the Mangusian unit um, oh, the compositional unit. Okay, now, yeah. now I'm not as afraid. You're not um, like about, yeah. But yeah, no, I was going to open it. with um, an, uh, an admission that I don't necessarily know anything about paragraphs, but I do know something about the compositional unit that kind of declares itself to me at some point in a creative project made of language. And then I know how to assemble the project. Um, you know, just briefly about fragments. Um, I know, I know it's 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 very common to see white space on the page and conclude that what you've just read is a fragment, or to read something very short or something composed of very short units, and to assume that those units are are fragmented. And my only problem with the usage of the word fragment in that context is that. A fragment is something that's broken. And if something is small, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's broken. Um, and I, I wrote about this in my book, 300 Arguments. And it's, it's one of my favorite of the arguments because it's about animals. Um, and I go on to say, an ant is not a fragment of an elephant, except orthographically. <laughs> you know, an ant is complete in itself. And um, so, it, uh, you know, for one reason or another, Yankee thrift, the fact that I came up as a poet, um, that is something that I would love to talk more about with you, which I, I don't think we've ever talked about the fact that we both went through the poetry pro program, yeah. the poetry problem at Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, went and to, I went to the fiction uh, program, but I did, but I have a graduate degree in poetry. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. So my, my whole, my image of you has just shifted a little bit. Um, okay. That makes a little bit more sense. Um, did you get the poetry degree before or after I, after the before. fiction one? Before. Oh, before. Okay. So you did start out as a poem. Um, so, um, so right. Fragments, paragraphs, units. Um, I, you know, I teach the paragraph. It, it's so funny that I, I feel that I can teach things that I have no idea how to write. And I always, I have this bit about how a paragraph is like a door opening gradually and that the pacing of the opening of the door is not necessarily consistent and it's not necessarily, um, you know, accelerating. It could start quickly and get slower. And, oh man, I know I have all these examples, but um, but I don't really feel that I write in paragraphs. Um, the paragraph just seems like too large a unit to, to you know, move around. Like, I, I feel like I don't trust the, um, the coherence of the unit uh, unless I, you know, unless, unless I control it more closely. And um, so sometimes, I'm trying to think, I don't, I don't think my units have like necessarily, um, you know, changed in, you know, in time as I've written more books. I really do think that each book kind of announces the, sh the, the shape that it's going to need to, to take the, the frame that's going to need to fill whatever, you know, its form it declares its form and the units for that form. And then it just becomes very easy. A lot of it has to do. Um, it's funny that you brought up the um, the visual clarity of some of the images in my book. I don't think of myself as a visual writer at all, but I definitely think of myself as a somebody who hears the sound of the words. Um, and you know, I can make I can I can make all kinds of you know draw all kinds of tidy conclusions. Like I trained as a musician, um, you know, I I can't you know my drawings are not anything to write home about. Um, did you know Miley Malloy is like a really accomplished artist? Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, I also learned this last night. It was a big night for me. <laughs> um, 
So, uh, so yeah. Um, but do you, did you consider yourself like a nascent fiction writer while you were studying to be a poet? Um, or did it feel like you were in the right place at the right time? Like what, what happened? I, you know, I don't even know because as I, I wrote poetry and then I wrote short stories and then I wrote novels. And at one point I thought, oh, and then you wrote a memoir. I'm a novelist. And yeah. I wrote and I wrote a memoir, but then I went back to short stories and I often think, um, because I read poetry seriously, that someday I'll go back to poetry, but that I would need to block oh, off wow. a bunch of time so I could write bad poetry until I wrote the poetry that I wanted. Wow. But I do think, I do, I mean, I think that there's something, one of the things that I miss about poetry and that your novel has is that visual, not in terms of, images but that you open the book and that you understand about the way it's going to function because of how it is on the page and one of the things that I found so I, I read the book and then just in the past couple of days I listened to the audiobook and oh. which is terrific and one of the really? things that was really interesting ab about it is that the transitions between units are felt very meaningful to me but I think that when I read it not that I didn't think they were meaningful when I read it but I read them one at a time but hearing it I could hear there are jokes in those transitions and there are moments when it's heartbreaking when it goes and in in a way that is and again like the the way this book I'm trying to think of the right verb represents childhood is so beautiful and one of them is that it goes from something terrible to something just totally quotidian and um yeah childhood oh, that's that's a really good description of how childhood feels because you you know you don't know how anything works yet so there may be just the greatest shame imaginable followed by like nobody noticing your shame giving you a sandwich yeah um i um that's i i i like i like knowing that about the audiobook this is the first book that i haven't read the audiobook for and i haven't listened to it yet um and i yeah i don't you, you know you don't you, you nobody likes looking at themselves on video or listening to themselves um but it's like a, it's a whole different thing to listen to something that you wrote right. read by somebody else um I forgot the name of the reader, but she does a beautiful job. It's really she's terrific. I know. I I got to I got to listen to uh, the three or four people who are being considered for it, and the the woman that I chose, I think, has a, the perfect voice for the book. Yeah, it's yeah, she's it's great, fantastic. What what's so? What's your relationship to fiction? Like your oh. your lifelong relationship? I don't know. Curious. Um, <laughs> my experience. lifelong relation um well i i am a um i am a genre blind reader i guess uh i uh, i've always read fiction the fiction that i gravitate toward is um i don't know disobedient in some way i guess to the conventions i mean you know I, all writers say that they're like I read fiction, but it's it's only the best fiction. You know, it's not the fiction every every other writer reads. <laughs> so you know, that's the pat answer. Um, I no, I did definitely surprise myself by um, finding that I that it was necessary to write a novel in order to manage this material. Um, I'd always wanted to write about Massachusetts, and I sort of had this ideal book in my imagination that I called the Boston Book, and it would be this like. You know, it'd be the, it would be like a, a, a 450 page novel with like lots of sociological asides and like I would do all this research and I did in fact do a lot of research and I read about, um, you know, like people who were considered white in the 20th century in Massachusetts um, versus those that were considered kind of provisionally white or in between. Um, immigrants from places like Italy and Ireland and Ashkenazi Jews sort of dwelt in this in between off whiteness, which I, you know, I just read, I just read a couple of um, pages about. 
And um, I could never like really, I mean, maybe you know what I'm talking about, but like I, I knew what needed to be e expressed, but I couldn't do it. Like I didn't have enough I didn't have enough memories. Like there were, like I had, I, and I found that a lot of memories of Massachusetts from the time of my childhood were marked by blanks, omissions, or muteness, emptiness, blankness, silence. There was so much silence that I remember, but it's like very meaningful silence. And at the same time, I couldn't really say, like, oh, that little thing that I noticed about my friend meant that some terrible thing happened to her because, um, you know, a lot of what wasn't talked about um, in cultures like this was the way that silence functions as a tool that the powerful can use to abuse the vulnerable. And that was very much part of what it was like to be a girl in that place and time, maybe a girl in that time period or a girl in any time period. Um, so, uh, you know, so I, you know, I, I, I read all of these books about, um, you know, when the Irish became white, when the Jew, how the Jews became white, um, you know, how um, Black people are actually less Black than the Irish were at one point. I mean, it really made no, I mean, race makes no sense, but I mean, it really made no sense. And, um, and then I realized that it would be necessary to use some, I mean, even then I wasn't thinking like novel, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe there are some components of fiction that might need to be brought into this project because, you know, I never thought of myself as a novelist. Like it took the longest time to kind of break down that internal barrier um, between, you know, me being myself and me being like potentially somebody who could write a novel. But once that, once I was able to dismantle that bizarre, division that I think it, I think was sown at Iowa where there's like a extreme at least in the 90s when I was there was there was an extremely high wall between the learning that the poets did and the learning that the uh, fiction writers did and you weren't allowed to take the fiction workshop I mean it was like <laughs> it was um yeah, I don't know. It was like it was like a pastor saying, like, you shall not read these books, you shall read those books. Only it was, you know, Wallace Stevens and Keats. Um, so, you know, for whatever reason, I just um it took an awfully long time for me to um admit that it actually is possible to write a novel if you know if if you need to write a novel in order to engage all the material that you had. And so um, you know, long story short, I wrote a novel and that was the way, that was the only way that I could do it. It's interesting that it was the Boston book because one of the, the fascinating things about this book is that Boston is it's not Boston. mentioned. Yeah, I know. And if it's it all, not. If it all, maybe it says downtown, I can't remember now, but it's about, it's about the, provincialness. It, yeah, it's, it's about, right. it's about, right, exactly. It's about what it is to be um, in a small place, trapped in a small place but you know invisibly like you know she could have gotten on her bike and rode to the next town but she never does um and, and yes the book wasn't it wasn't at all about boston that was just my nickname for it um and uh you know perhaps not uh surprisingly i uh you know now that i've i've, I've written about the gendered violence that i needed to write about i now need to write about the whiteness some more um and that's going to be i mean i can't not i i can't not set it in massachusetts like that that's just going to be another book about massachusetts um and again you know william maxwell consoles me because what he wrote like 10 novels in every single one of them there's a dead mother yep. his mother died when you know of the flu when he was i think four years old um yeah so you apparently you can just keep doing that yeah the, they came like swallows and so long see you tomorrow yep both I, and I can't even remember how many decades are between the two. Time will darken it. Um, yeah. The one about the two teenage boys, several of the short stories. Yeah, there's like a missing mother, dead mother, dying mother. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say, I've read All the Days and Nights, the collection of stories. Those are wonderful. At, 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 like a very sad moment in my life. And it was so consoling. Yeah. Yeah. There's a kindness to him. You know, I actually sent, I read that book in Iowa and I sent him a fan letter and it was the first fan letter I had ever sent to a writer. Wow. And he wrote back. 
wow. he wrote back when he was like 89. It, uh, it oh God, I think I still remember. It was very short. He just said, dear Sarah Manguso, thank you for the exceedingly kind note. Yours truly, William Maxwell. That's so lovely. Typewriter. Yeah, that's that was really, really wonderful. When I was at Iowa, we were, we all read so long. It was the book that was handed around. Oh, that's so interesting. When I was there, it was Jesus's son. Oh, see that it came out after I was there 88 to 90. And okay. one of the main reasons I stopped reading, writing poetry is that Iowa was the only place I got funding and I applied in both and I only got it in fiction. And because of that oh. strong division, yep, that was it. it was, yeah. that, that was it. That the oh. decision was made for me. Oh my God. <sighs> I feel like we're like, um, you know, we we got sprung out of out of genre <laughs> jail and we're like telling the terrible stories of our imprisonment. <laughs> so much better to not think that they're. I agree uh, thoroughly. I mean, obviously, yes. And that and that nonfiction is a different program, and they really discouraged writing tradition. Yep. Tradition. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I love the faculty in the nonfiction program. I think they're they're collecting just a really really wonderful group of really interesting writers. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I, and I had stu I had a student who went through through both you and Lee who who oh she did started, both she started in nonfiction and then came to fiction. Oh, that's interesting. John Degada did uh, poetry and then nonfiction, and now runs the nonfiction program. I didn't know that about Ian Lee. Do, is the book, the new book you're working on or you're thinking about, about whiteness, is it fiction or nonfiction or? That's going to be fiction. Um, but I have a book that is, well, also a novel that I somehow wrote uh, during quarantine. And um, it is about lying. Wow. Is it, is it coming? coming soon? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, Catherine Lacey's reading it right now. <laughs> Get to work, Catherine. Um, she's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. You know, it's in that phase where you, you think it might be done or that you should just never show it to anybody else ever again. So, so um, yeah, it's in that in-between phase. So maybe, maybe impending, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I'm gonna ask one more question then I'm gonna go to um, okay, great. questions from the audience which is because one of the things this book feels like it's about is about time. And it is, and I think this is one of the reasons why I wouldn't necessarily have guessed this is the, the form your novel would take is that it is fascinatingly chronological and with one ex sort of exception in the middle um, with the, the Winifred section, yeah, which I, loved and i loved that one because otherwise it it feels sort of brutally chronological in the way that life itself is chronologically <laughs> brutally <laughs> chronological um but in the middle of the book ruthie who's the the narrator of this this book and we i, I don't know whether it says how old she is when the book starts no for yeah first grade second grade yeah. third grade yeah young and then in the middle of the book she begins to write a story about the people who live. Well, she's th she's thinking it, but yes, she she engages in creative writing, thinking. Yeah, I, I meant right. right oh, you know, yeah. Okay. Form. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that. Um, first of all, I love the phrase "brutally chronological." That is so accurate uh, descriptor of life, and also possibly this book. Um, the Winifred part is the first part of the book that I wrote. Oh, wow. And um, I'll confess to you that uh, I wrote it because I'd applied for an NEA grant 7,000 times. And then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to write the most conventional kind of, you know, like a period piece of, uh, you know, like a, a posh woman who's had to marry money in order to keep the real estate in her family. And, um, you know, it's like from a different time and like, you know, the narrator couldn't possibly have anything to do with me. And it's like really fiction. And maybe I'll get an NEA grant with that because nothing I've ever actually written <laughs> um, has, uh, you know, been successful in that arena. And um, so I did that, didn't get the grant, totally fine. I, you know, I'm housed and insured, but, um, 
but then when I started the, um, you know, the, the, the larger narrative, I could not, I could not eliminate Winifred totally. And then I realized that it's because Ruthie creates her and Ruthie creates her. It's not that she's just sort of daydreaming. She's inventing this metaphysics of escape. And she's also inventing what she thinks a woman of agency would be. Um, and since all of the persons of agency in her actual life are men who prey on vulnerable women and girls, her idea of a powerful woman is a woman who takes sexual advantage of the teenage boy who lives next door. And it, you know, it, it kind of, Ruthie kind of tells it as a romance, but it's not a romance, it's predation. No. I mean, I'm like grinning as I say this, I don't <laughs> know why, but, um, you know, it's predation. And it's, um, and so in imagining that a woman could possibly, you know, not be the vulnerable one in some, in some kind of relationship, I think that really is the beginning of Ruthie recognizing that she too might actually escape Waitsfield. I, I also love it. Just be, I love all of the details. And also that I think when you're 13, as she is, when she's, yes. when she's thinking about this, it's a time where fantasy still exists as vividly oh, in yeah. some ways as when you're a little kid and she believes, she believes it. Um, and I feel yeah. like I haven't, I haven't ever read anything that talks about the, the things that 13 year olds can believe that we think, oh, you know, they're almost grown ups. Yeah, but it seems so true to me. Oh God, that yeah, that that hits really hard. I have a ten-year-old son, and um, you know this will come as no surprise to anybody who's parented somebody for more than ten years. But I didn't. I mean, I remember being ten and feeling like a fully formed human. But I now I see that a ten-year-old is a it's a baby. Yeah. It's a baby, as is a thirteen-year-old. Yep. It's a it's just a baby, and so yes, there are these imagined lives. I know, you know the greater part of my son's like felt life, it belongs to him now in a way that it won't belong to me, but he's still just a baby imagining things. I'm gonna ask you some, some audience uh, Okay, questions. great, I'm gonna open this pane so I can read them too. Your book has an honest narrator, a good ending and never a boring moment. How do you manage to handle your pacing? Oh my God. <laughs> That's a terribly <laughs> difficult question to answer. Um, how did you do that? Well, um, good ending. Well, I, I will talk about the ending. Um, there are, not everybody is satisfied with the ending. Um, so this, this questioner, um, this questioner uh, finds the ending satisfying. Writing the ending was surprising for me. Um, in that I, it was one of the first times that I had the um, experience that I've heard so many fiction writers talk about, which is that the, you know, there's sort of, there's, there's a machinery at work that you've built. And so when you come up with the ending, it's not really just you projecting some idea of what you want the ending to be or what you think the ending should be, um, you know, reasonably or aesthetically. Like it really did feel like all I had to do was observe the existing form of the book. And then, and then it would sort of, it would almost like, I don't know, it almost like sort of give me a, a clue, like, you know, Ouija board, like um, give me some sense of what needed to happen in order to have that that um, you know, sort of final deliverance or apotheosis or you know that Act Three uh, you know final feeling, um, and that was that was um, you know that's the first time that had ever had ever happened to me. Um, so um, yeah, I can tell you that you know the ending kind of came out of that somewhat mystical experience. Pacing, um, you know, I also have. Uh, an editor who happens to be an absolute fucking genius at um, at pacing and ordering and chronology, and her name is Parissa Ibrahimi at Hogarth, and um, she is she is you know one of the highest angels of uh, editorial heaven. 
So um, yeah, the, she, she deserves at least some credit for the pacing. Here's a, a, maybe a slightly re related question um, from somebody who's read and reread The Guardians um, and finds it moves her just as much every time. Um, did writing your novel feel different to you because your readership might be different this time? Did it feel different? It did feel different. I don't know. Um, I, I wasn't thinking about readership in any conscious way. Um, you know, there, there, there is one thing that's true about my writing process. And that's as soon as I start imagining, like, um, as, as soon as I start feeling oracular, like, you know, with the presence of a potential audience or, you know, even like an audience, you know, witnessing me writing it, um, the tone just goes all wrong. Like, it's because mm. I'm not, a, I'm not a performer. Like, that's not the mode from which I think my work really issues. Um, I am, you know, for better or worse, I'm, I'm a writer. I do all of my, I do all of the, the heavy lifting behind the scenes alone, talking to myself. And um, so if the, if the project of writing this book felt different from writing my previous books of prose, which were all nonfiction, um, it, wa it wasn't about the audience. It, it was about just having to engage these these new components of narrative, fictional components of narrative that I hadn't engaged before. Can you, you so you felt that they were, those components were distinctly oh, yeah. different. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I was terrified for like the first half of the um, time that I worked on this book because I was just burdened by this idea that I couldn't possibly be a fiction writer. I couldn't write a novel, that this was just some weird new kind of nonfiction that I was writing. Um, which, yeah, <laughs> stories we dialogue, or I'm just thinking of the no, because I was writing down things that were speculative and not necessarily oh, true. It's it's fun, don't you think? Oh, not of course you would say that. No, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it, you know, but but at the same time, I I feel just as funny when I hear a fiction writer say like, oh god, I couldn't possibly, I hate writing nonfiction, it's so hard, and like what. All you do is take what's there and tidy it up. And um, with fiction, you have to like invent a whole world. Like that's work. That's, I don't know. That doesn't, it, it hasn't yeah, come naturally to me. Right. But say that again. You don't have to get it right. You don't have to get it right. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Mm, but you do, you do. <laughs> so uh, here's another question that is connected to nonfiction versus fiction. Um, talking about you saying that uh, you're able to write about things that you wanted to in fiction. I'm keenly interested in the political utility of particular genres. Um, and one of you might say more about uh, generic specificity of fiction. Um, that what, what, what does fiction allow you to do that you couldn't do in nonfiction? Well, first I'd like to um, call out this questioner. Um, she is my cousin. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Stacy. Um, she is uh, an academic and the author of several books. Okay, all right. I won't get distracted. Um, all right. Um, so um, the political utility of particular genres, um, fiction, and um, let's see. You know, I, I guess I would say that I, I would be very hesitant to make any grand pronouncements about the sociological function of fiction versus nonfiction. I mean, certainly there are obvious different, you know, there are certain obvious differences. Like you can, you can maybe write about things in a, um, if you don't live in a free society where you can publish a book that is critical of the ruling class or the ruling regime, you, you, know, you use poetry or you use fiction and, um, you know, and you still maybe get disappeared and murdered. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I can only speak for myself and, um, and um, you know, we, we talked just a little bit about this before, but um, I would just, um, because so much of what I needed to write about, what I, what I, what I was interested in writing about was characterized by um, an environment in which there's so little dialogue and there's so little 
content even. Um, and, uh, you know, not, not to kind of veer too far into, you know, stereotypical New England-iness, but, um, you know, it's like people, people don't really talk about themselves. People don't really talk about their feelings. Um, and so I, um, you know, as a young person, like, you know, just sort of like eating up this default experience of the world, learning, learning how the world worked, um, I found that so many of my memories were just, they just like weren't, um, they, they were so incomplete and they're so characterized by just like my having noticed one little detail that suggested so much. Uh, I had to, I mean, it's, it was like an iceberg. I mean, to use like a really familiar uh, metaphor here, but like, you know, I could see that tip of the iceberg and it, it suggested the rest of the iceberg, but I could, I just didn't feel, I mean, there was, there was no way that I could, um, you know, just write down all of my speculation um, and even some things that I just invented from whole cloth in order to like support the forms of these speculations and these, you know, some of these things, which were actual memories, um, you know, I, I, I just, there was no way I could do it in nonfiction responsibly. Um, furthermore, uh, there were um, people who are still living whose stories I borrowed liberally from and, you um, I, um, you know, I realized that I was free to use that material if it was fiction. I could change it. I could, um, and, you know, sometimes it was just like it, it, it made the narrative better to change it. And that's the, that's, that is what I learned or I began to learn how to do in writing this book. And that, that's not something that I did before in nonfiction. I guess before there was just always enough material that I didn't need to, you know, sort of uh, trespass into the tools of fiction in order to finish. This, I'm going to try to synthesize um, a couple of questions that I think follow on from that, which is one of the things about this book is that it's about cruelty and violence. Yeah. And in fact, that is one of the things that feels it's, it's fuller of cruelty than I think your, the, your nonfiction books in oh, a definitely. way that there's there's room for it. I wonder whether, because you don't have to have anybody say, oh, it didn't actually happen like that. Or I think you're misremembering mm. or, and I wonder if that's connected. And the book gets crueler as it goes on. I mean, in really fascinating ways. It, it I, I mean, it seems so obvious that that must have been a reason for my having chosen fiction, um, it wasn't consciously, but that makes perfect sense to me. Of course, there's the safety of saying, well, you know, I, I can say this because nobody, nobody can tell me that the book is wrong or not true because none, you know, it's, it's just fiction. <laughs> it's like that scene in Lost Boys. It's just rice, Michael. Maybe that's not an actually um, relevant, uh, comparison, but, um, but yes, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, which is why, you know, Bosco Popa writing in Yugoslavia, uh, you know, he wrote about the regime in poetry that made no sense to anybody who didn't know that he was a poet writing about the regime in Yugoslavia. Um, and, you know, certainly I'm not, I am, I am in no danger of, um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, there's nothing brave about uh, writing a novel in comparison to people who are actually putting their lives at risk in doing their work. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would use the word safety. Like, yeah, there's nothing, um, it's, I will say, I, maybe this is one of the last things I'll uh, be able to say during this time together, but, um, it has been um, wonderfully uh, freeing not to have to talk about myself in, um, in engaging with readers about this book. I don't mind talking about myself, but like myself isn't really relevant to this. I had some, uh, I had 
some anticipation that maybe people will say like, well, aren't you Ruthie? And isn't this person, this person? And, and you know, happily, um, I, I haven't really had to contend with any of those assumptions. Whereas when you publish a memoir, as you know, personally, you know, people, people will ask you anything, <laughs> you know, they think that, you know, because this, this book represents you, like they, they can just ask you anything about yourself and it doesn't have to be at all germane to the book. Um, yeah, all, all of that is completely eliminated in the experience of publicizing a novel. Sarah, it's 7.30. I or know. It's 8.30. It's 8.30 where green light well, is. It's 5.30. Come on. <laughs> but, um, but yes, um, this was such a pleasure. Thank you oh, so I'm much sorry. to everybody for your great questions. And thank you, Elizabeth. I really, this was such a pleasure. It was so much fun. Thank you both so much for this conversation, for joining us in all different time zones um, and letting us spend an hour with you. Um, once again, the buy link is in the chat. You can get very cold people from Greenlight Bookstore. We forgot to, we forgot to pitch it. You asked us <laughs> to pitch it. We forgot buy the to books. pitch it. Buy I shamelessly books. asked you. Yes, and you can find more books by Elizabeth and Sarah on our website as well. So thank you guys so much for being here. Um, have a great evening. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Bye. Good night.